All right. Well, anyways, let's begin. So we're just so happy to have you all here at our open house with Mark Twain Elementary. I'm Naomi, and I'm an inclusion specialist um, from our demo sites team um, through the Herring Center for Inclusive Education, and I'm going to be facilitating today. Um, but today really is all about Mark Twain and you all so that we can have this opportunity for questions and dialogue, um, you know, to be able to learn more and about Mark Twain's inclusive master scheduling process, their supports for accessing core instruction, and their flexible service delivery. But as I was saying, most importantly, you will have time to ask questions, engage with the team, engage with one another, as well as just thinking about um, how you might apply some of your takeaways today to your own context. In terms of our agenda, um, the Twain team will share briefly about their journey and each of their inclusionary practices that they highlight at their school. And after sharing about each, we'll open up for questions and discussion. So feel free to unmute um, or type questions in the chat during that time. And we'll also have time for additional questions and discussion towards the end of the session. So just to orient you to our resources, all of Twain's previous webinars and their team's artifacts, amazing artifacts, um, are posted on our website. Thanks, Kathy, for putting that in the chat. And our site also has additional information about the project, the Demo Sites Project and the other demonstration schools. And we encourage you to check it out if you haven't done so already. Um, finally, just message me at any point um, directly through the chat. Let me know if you're having any technical issues or other concerns throughout, and I will do my best to support you um, throughout today's session. Great. So we want to know a little bit more about um, who's here. So if you haven't done so already, take a minute to unmute or put in the chat to share who you are, um, what school or community you're representing, and also what impact you um, are hoping today's open house will have on your own school or district or community's um, inclusionary practices. Um, you can also share your contact information if you'd like. And just a few reminders, we'll have plenty of time for asking questions and engaging discussions. So just remember, um, to mute yourself when you're not talking. And we just appreciate all of you being here. So I see Cynthia's joining us from Ix Issaquah. We have Emily from North Kitsap, wonderful. Um, let's see, Jen from North Kitsap, Sarah from Lake Chelan, that's wonderful. Great representation here today. So keep that coming. I see Julie from Evergreen, Hoping to get ideas for planning together when it's not scheduled. Excellent. Um, wonderful. Keep those coming. And in the interest of just prioritizing your time to chat with one another, we'll keep things moving. I'm just going to move that. Great. So here is our twin team um, who will be you know, on our panel today for the open house, we have Craig Mott, who is our the principal at Twain, Leah Goodfellow, the associate principal, and Jamie Chapel, third grade teacher, and Kelly Osborne, a special education teacher at the school. And they're gonna be guiding you through their journey and their expertise in the areas they wanna to highlight today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you all. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I am Craig Mott, Principal at Mark Twain. Um, if you've joined us for any of our other webinars, uh, what we've tried to do is diversify who's present, presenting information to you all. So although uh, the other ones had larger groups of people, we've tried to create a little more intimate opportunity. Um, however, in the audience, I also see that we have a couple of our other members that are also available to answer questions as we kind of go through the process. So you know, Jen, Lauren, if you have the input as we go through in, in some of the discussion points, I encourage you to share as well. Um, we are Mark Twain. We're one of 29 elementary schools in the Lake Washington School District. Uh, we're located up in the North Rose Hill area. So we split a little bit of Redmond, but mostly Kirkland. Um, we're a large elementary school. We have about 630 students. Um, in a typical year, we started this year at 650. 
Uh, since we've returned back to in-person, we're the second largest elementary. We have close to 460 students on campus four days a week. Um, so that's created some new and different experiences for us as we, we navigate the pandemic. Um, we, prior to this um, open house, um, Ali and I were actually in a meeting trying to determine what next year is gonna look like. We're all kind of waiting on pins and needles to find out if we're gonna be in person and back to a normal routine or whether or not we will be providing some kind of uh, normal schedule, but also an online model. Um, for today's purposes, uh, what we're really gonna kind of talk about is kind of our inclusionary um, focus and that has been on master scheduling, providing a flexible service model and access to core instruction. Uh, we started this journey about five or six years ago. Um, it had to do kind of dual paths. One of it had one reason was we had a student who was coming to us who um, was looking for a fully inclusive model, which we hadn't uh, anticipated at that point, but that was something that we wanted to go down that path. And then the second was we were starting to gather input from our parents as well as from our students that they weren't liking the service model that we were providing. And so we started that dialogue as a staff and part of our learning through this whole process was we've become very present in our decision making. And part of that had to do with in our best interests, uh, uh, as we tried to become more inclusive, we actually started to create more barriers along the way. And so we had to be ongoing and self-reflective all the time. The other component of it was we, we wanted to be able to do something different than what our system currently provided. And our system currently provided um, standardized district programming. Um, in our district, we offer an IC program uh, we also earn, offer a learning center program, which is for our profound and um, uh, impacted students. Our IC program is more behavior. And those were district programs that are placed at different schools and school students would then travel to those schools. For us, we were concerned because we we're losing some of our community members and our community members being students who should be at Mark Twain were actually being sent to other schools and their siblings or their neighbors were like, well, my, my, my friend or my son or my daughter or my brother and sister can't come to school with me. And so that was another reason why we started to kind of inquire about what is exactly going on. And so part of it was us advocating for those programs to come to our school. Now we recognize that's a conflict in terms of a program that is placed at a school that is designed to um, provide specific instruction, but was seclusive. Um, and so what we tried to do was start looking at the different students who were in those programs and start to see if we could actually create a more inclusive opportunity for them. And that started really from getting the opportunity to visit some other schools around the area that helped kind of give us some interest or look for us or ideas that we could put into perspective for our own building. One of those things was around master schedule development. Um, when I came to the school nine years ago and, and in talking with colleagues around the state, you know, there's different ways that we all develop our master schedules. In one way, and for us, when I arrived here at Mark Twain, our specialists developed it. And so it was our PE, our music, and our librarian that sat down they came up with a master schedule that ensured that everybody got their adequate amount of specialists. Um, we're a district that uses itinerants um, for, for our specialists as well. So we had to meld that into to the equation, but it never was really about focusing on a specific area. And so that was also something that we wanted to be able to, to address. Um, secondly, I've seen master schedules developed with special education students in mind first. And what we wanted to get away from was not identify them as special education. That's not a placement. That's a service model that, that we help support students. And so they're gen ed students first. And so we wanted to look at creating a master schedule that focused on their, their ability to access general education. And then obviously uh, the last part there is, you know, we have a huge push with our primary teachers about servicing primary and core academics in the morning and pushing their, their specialist times in the afternoon, which is not always an easy thing to do. 
uh, especially with a large school and when you're sharing staff. So really what we started to do, and that was part of our inclusive team and our special education team and Malia and myself and some of our directors was kind of looking at a new perspective, something that was more interest driven, um, specifically around what we heard from teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, was around the whole idea of common planning. How do we develop a common planning uh, opportunity for our grade level teachers? Um, along those same lines was inter interdisciplinary grade level teams and how could we bring our specialists onto those teams, whether they were safety net teachers or special ed teachers or ELL teachers and, and really have a whole team looking at the broader grade level and creating opportunities not only to provide MTSS or tier one interventions, but how to create access points for our kids who are maybe receiving SDI in content areas. The other thing that became very apparent to us, and we, we noticed this at a couple of our, our visits to other schools, was their students were accessing core. And that was the one thing that we felt that a large proportion of our students, and as much as 90 to 95 percent of our students, should be able to access core curriculum, not replacement curriculum, which typically happens with pullout or, or replacement curriculum that is based off ability we felt that we should be able to have all of our students access that core curriculum with the best instructional uh, uh, instructors, which is their gen ed teacher. And what we could do is look at ways to build that master schedule around not pulling them out of that core content area. Uh, the fourth area there, student voice became more and more apparent and loud. Um, as we started this process, we started to hear our older intermediate students saying, I don't wanna be pulled out of class anymore. I feel different every time I get pulled out of class. And so we started to listen to our students with intention of not making them feel more awkward or uncomfortable with what's going on. And we also included them to, uh, in their IEP meetings where they started to tell us the same thing. And so that, that helped to, to um, kind of give that, that whole idea momentum. And then the last part was just impact of all students. We wanted our, our master schedule to, to focus on how do we impact all of our students, create an authentic community, and one where all of our students felt like they were getting all the aspects of learning that they deserved. Thanks so much, Craig. It's such an important part of your journey to hear about that student voice, and we really appreciate you launching us into our discussion. So now we just want to hear um, from you all and what you're thinking and wondering about. Um, and so now is the time to share questions. Um, you can unmute yourself. You can share in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and put just a list of questions that might be on your mind related to Twain's journey. Um, Feel free to ask any of these or others that um, um, might be coming up for you. You know, I know often um, when people are starting this journey, people wonder how do you kind of get that buy-in from staff, from the community, from the district. I wonder if any of our team can speak to that um, aspect of your journey a little bit more. Our um, inclusion journey was kind of gradual too. We didn't just dive in all in one year. And so originally it was kind of brought up where it was highlighted that we did have some students kind of integrating into the general ed classroom for maybe a subject at a time and we were being we were able to see that that student was able to succeed in the general education classroom when they had the supports with grade level peers and that kind of excited people and we were able to highlight and share like what was successful with this student and in this classroom and how did you be able to find that success because I think with the teachers a lot, it's not necessarily like, I don't want this student in my classroom. It's really more like, how do I make this work? And so once we knew that there was ways that it could work and there were teachers in our building that could help support us with that. And we shared that at staff meetings and that kind of excited more people to wanna to try it and kind of learn more about different strategies that we could use in our own classrooms. Thank <laughs> you. 
Can you talk a little bit about how um, you are actually able to get that schedule so that staff are planning together? I mean, when I think about the um, amount of the reading specialists, me as a special ed teacher, gen ed teacher, um, any of the para support, how does, how does that happen regularly? Yeah, so when we created our master schedule, what we looked at was how do we ensure that students access core instruction? And so we're, we're really trying to break it down into a block of time that individuals will be accessing that area. But we also recognize, you know, there's legal ramifications around SDI minutes and so forth that we need to be mindful of. And so what we developed was actually content area power groups. And so what those power groups were designed to do is they're data-driven groups that um, encompass every student. And so if you're at a grade level, for example, we use first grade, um, they have, uh, as the example on the board here, they have, they have math. And this is our master schedule for, um, we did this for remote learning this year. So this is a remote schedule on the, on the sorry, on the computer right now. So you could see, we recognize that core um, direct instruction and, and um, the ability to tune in to a teacher on a computer screen. We needed to be mindful that we had to break it down into 15 to 25 minute chunks. Anything beyond that, we lost our students. And so what we tried to do in those situations was just be really intentional with that direct instruction. What we then did after is you can see there's a math power group. And so that math power group are design power groups where students travel to a new person. It could be extension, it could be ch uh, challenge, it could be remediation, it could be SDI minutes in a specific content that could be serviced by a very flexible staffing model. And so what we tried to do was then um, utilize our staff in a meaningful way. And so, for example, a first grade power group could have actually 13 support members, and we could have 13 groups happening at that, at that time. And so we could have a couple of special education students, a couple of ELL teachers, a couple of safety net or lap teachers, along with the court uh, teachers. And then we also have some des um, designated paraeducators who could also deliver instruction at that point. And so all of those members actually are part of the common planning and so that they know exactly kind of what's happening and they're using the data along the way to, to help differentiate. And so kids can move at any, you know, as they're going through, if, the, if their data is starting to show that kids are making ground and they need to be moved, we can sh quickly shift them into a new group. Um, and we do that both for ELA and math. And so what we end up doing then is just making sure that um, we have enough people to help support to make those into meaningful groups. Now, we've also told our staff that we don't want paraeducators taking our lowest kids. And actually our staff agrees with that. They generally take the lowest kids and our paraeducators are taking our highest kids at that point because then they can go into different ideas of challenge and so forth that are, that are pretty fun for the kids that to go through to get common planning for everybody to be a part of that process is the biggest challenge. And we had to get creative um, because depending on how many classroom teachers you had would dictate kind of what was going on. For example, I have right now, I have a mat or a PE. I currently have a full-time PE, a full-time library and a full-time music teacher. And if I have five teachers, um, we couldn't just use itinerant staffing as the, as the method to get to that point. And so what we did was we got creative and I talked to my counselor and I said, you know what, you're going to become a specialist at this point. You're going to offer 30 minutes of cell instruction every day to, kid, for, to a grade level. And we started rotating through so we could actually develop um, grouping of time so that they could actually meet as a common planning period. We also um, did some grade level recesses mm -hmm. uh, in order to provide common planning. So when in some of our grade levels, we have five teachers, like Craig said. So um, that's where the IAs were able to support. And we had recesses at really unusual times, um, not what we usually think of. In fact, one of our recesses was actually first thing in the morning. 
Uh, and at first that felt weird, but then it was the fifth grade and the fifth grade teachers ended up loving it because the kids got to school, they got their social time out, they ran around and they came and they were ready to go. So it actually ended up working out, um, but that was another way we were able to attach common planning. Right, here's my stupid question. So lunches for teachers that typically happen during recess were being supported in a different way? So our lunches right now are duty-free lunches. And so we schedule um, our lunches around um, no academic time essentially happening at that point. And so what they do is, is they have a it's part of their planning, the way the contractual works, 30 minutes of duty-free lunch, and then we build planning around that. And so they may be doing a, a recess. Uh, teachers aren't. We, we may build recess and lunch around that period of time. To but ensure. it could be that like a PE teacher or someone or the counselor would pick up that class sure. after their yeah. lunch and lunch recess so that yeah. we could back up a planning time for common planning. Yeah, yeah. Really, for us, it is we get our allocation of staffing from our, our teaching and learning department. And what we've done is we've built capacity with our teams to say, hey, this is not going to look like it normally has in years past. Now, we're, we're fortunate because we do get some additional staffing. We have one. We have the largest elementary special education teams in the district. Um, I have 25 uh, members on my SPED team right now. Um, that includes five full-time teachers, um, because as I said, I have two um, learning center programs, and then I have an IC program. Then we also have two resource teachers that uh, um, are staffed to us. And so what we also know is we have support personnel that goes along to, with that that is contractual, um, but we also then have, you know, regular behavior texts that are on staff or, and, and other support personnel that we bring into it. And so we are fortunate, but it's not, I don't want people to think this is defined by, by the number of people we have, because I think part of it is, is just thinking outside the box. And so one of the things we do with our, our, our power groups is we, we have a, a very collaborative and conscious discussion about whether or not this could be taught. Does it need to be taught SDI by a special education teacher or can it be taught by an ELL teacher? And as long as we're progress monitoring and managing where we are with our, our IEP goals and, and so forth and vice versa, they're making progress on their language proficiency, we can, we can have that flexibility as we're working with those individuals. And it's actually created some excitement for some of those teachers that have typically just been stuck doing one thing. Now they have the opportunity to be able to um, push in and do a co-teach. We've had some of our special ed teachers go in and co-teach um, in content areas, um, or they're providing access points to curriculum. Um, Alicia, who's on here, can talk about how she's provided professional development around um, accommodation and tools that we can use um, for kids to have success. I think the other piece of it with our common planning is really being mindful to look at the standard. What is the standard asking us to do? And because I think at times what ends up people happening is people read the standard and says, oh, students need to produce, um, I'll throw something out there, um, seven sentences um, to create a paragraph. And you know we have at times, and we were guilty of it too, people looking at it literally as set, creating seven sentences. And we said, why can't they dictate seven sentences, right? Use the assistive technology to be able to dictate that or, or have a dialogue and maybe tell a story using uh, uh, the seven sentences. And so we're trying to get people to think outside the box in terms of even how they're getting production coming out of our students, which is, I think, helping in this process. One of the things that what our teammate Lauren put in the chat too is we because we have such a big team we've been able to split ourselves up onto different grade levels to support. So because there's five special ed teachers we've got a couple different of our safety net reading specialists and a couple EL teachers we've kind of divided amongst the grade levels to be able to participate in that common planning conversation. So we meet once a week with our grade level teams um, to have those conversations about access points looking at our kids that are in that grade level and kind of their needs, their accommodations, um, their skill levels and say, how can we access this part of the lesson or this part of the lesson? And where is the part of the topic that they're gonna be able to put 
their input and their voice in and make sure that they are able to access that core instruction. So it's been great to be able to be a part of that planning conversation on the front side. And especially right now, our, you know, our wonderful gen ed teachers are getting weeks at a glance ahead of, of the week coming up. So that gives us specialists and special ed teachers time to to plan some accommodations and access points if it's creating a secondary lesson or an AT support to go alongside that um, or adding visuals in. So we've been able to be a part of that planning on the before side, which has been really great to do too. I love hearing about that. Um, I'm wondering if you could share even more just in terms of your experience around what laid the groundwork for some of that collaboration to feel successful, what might have been barriers that um, you found ways to cope with that other people might relate to? Sure. Um, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was uncomfortable when we first started. It's its a little bit of a of an awkward conversation to get started. And, you know, um, coming into a grade level that's already established and trying to respect their process. Every, every group, every team has a process of how they're approaching things, how they go about planning and coming in wanting to support and wanting to, to learn alongside them. You know, I, I'm a learning center teacher, so I teach our predominantly self-contained kiddos um, who have more of an integrated approach. So coming from maybe not as much experience in the gen ed curriculum side of things too. Um, so just having that conversation of trying to look at things from different lenses, like Craig was talking about. And if we're having, um, you know, if we've got a kiddo in the class who uses a communication output device, how can we support them in maybe a writing lesson? Or um, one of the things I had the privilege of being able to do this year was te to create vocabulary lessons using our assistive technology program and create visual vocabulary for kiddos who may um, struggle with reading or um, different things like that. So just creating um, different modes of opportunity for kids to participate in the lesson and learn the same thing, but maybe approach it in a different way. Um, and just being able to dialogue that and helping our colleagues realize they do so much of this already. And it's just getting it on paper and actually writing it down and saying, oh, we actually are doing this. We're actually doing this, but you were already doing it before. So just trying to open up that conversation and make it more dialogue and, um, you know, really empowering to support within the classroom with the wonderful experience and knowledge that our colleagues already have. And, and I see that Cassie put it in the chat as well. Um, we also, um, we haven't been super strict on this, especially with COVID and having remote and in-person and all kinds of things going on, but we do have protocols around team conversations and what those conversations should look like specifically data teaming and really making sure that we're looking at data for power groups and are the kids in the right group? Do they need to move? Are we meeting the targets as a team? Um, and so that's also been an important part of the process that everyone's involved in. So there could be a safety net teacher at the table or a EL teacher at the table that might know a student better. Um, and so everybody's able to collaborate on that. And I think one of the major benefits has been kind of ownership of all students uh, as, a, as a team. And, and teachers feeling empowered to serve all students versus having the uh, silos, but having those conversations and empowering the gen ed teachers to, they were, like Kelly said, they're already doing these things. Um, so really just empowering them to keep going. Thanks for adding that on, Malia. Um, I'm seeing some questions in the chat that I want to point in your direction. Um, Cynthia, the team is going to get much more into um, power groups in a moment here. So um, we'll get to that for sure. I'm also seeing Emily, um, who's asking, um, I'm curious I'm whether- sure I, Yeah, I'm not sure if I, I adequately explained it, but I think one of the issues that we have um, is that all of our students get core, and then we have kind of like you have power groups, we have, it's called what I need time, when time. So that's already built in, but the difficulty we're seeing is that what happens is then the kids can access core and, t and the win time, but what ends up happening is that win time is also when students may go to lap support or they go to sped special ed services, but there's not an opportunity for them to get core, lap, and special ed. And that's one of the issues we're having is that it's, it's frustrating that we have kids who are getting core 
now they're taking away the lap services where they're not making progress and we're putting them in special ed like she has a magic wand that's going to change everything when really we need to increase you know frequency and and intensity so um just curious how that so I think that's part of the, the, the direct collaborative conversation you need to have as a team. And what we end up doing is prioritizing. And so like one of, for example, we'll, we'll sit down with our, our LAP or our safety net teachers and our ELL teachers and, and our special ed teachers for that matter and determine, is this a language issue or is this a reading issue that we need to focus? And who, who, who would best serve those students in that situation? And so as a district, you, we don't qualify a student, well, very few, I shouldn't say we never, very few students qualify in reading and ELL. They, we just don't do that as a district. We de delineate this as a language issue and we, we're focusing on um, their the English language component or is it a reading component of it? And so that's part of the dialogue that we have. I, the second thing we talk about is, is, is whether or not um, some of the needs can be met by one of those other teachers in that situation. So like I said, we may have students who qualify uh, based off of uh, the data that we're looking at. They may be a student on an IEP for basic reading, but they may have a safety net teacher who's working on using the core curriculum um, with extension and focusing on that piece at that time. And so what we're trying not to do is completely overwhelm students, to your point, where they, they, they may have multiple service areas that, that they need support. And we're trying to uh, integrate that or what we're trying to do is embed accommodations and strategies with the gen ed teacher um, so that we prioritize that piece. And so if, for example, Alicia is working with a fifth grade teacher on, um, um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. She may be talking with the gen ed teacher about how to embed some of that instructional practice that they can do in small group that could, to, could meet that need. And then when, he, when that student goes to power group, they may be getting support in the other area of, of need at that point. So it, it really comes down to the collaborative conversation component of saying, what, where is it right now that is the priority that we're focused on, on to help support that student right now? Does that, does that help, Emily? Kind it's, of. It sounds to me like we kind of have, you have a similar practice to us that we do end up having to make a, a decision. Yeah. The, the I think that's part, what we're looking at as, as a district is figuring out a way for, to add that extra piece of time in, in addition to the, yeah. the and, and that's where it's, it's hard. Yeah. I think it's been harder for us um, because we were, just as we started to get momentum with it, obviously the pandemic happened and we had to switch our, to, to where we are right now. And so I think our teachers have some, a little bit easier ability to provide that additional support because they can call them in remotely and do an online class on our Wednesday or a check-in day. Mm -hmm. um, obviously when we come back in next year, cause we're fully anticipating coming back in person, um, our goal will be to continue to, to try to limit the amount of time that they're not in core. We're, our, our priority is core and our priority is gonna be power group. The other component that we're also working on, and this is um, something that we're gonna be, we haven't really done before. We're looking at a co-teach model and we're bringing in an interventionist. So an ELL teacher will co-teach um, and actually Jamie's probably gonna do it with an ELL teacher and Jamie will co-teach um, content area specifically probably around science because we've had high success with our ELL students embedding language development in science curriculum um, and so they may go that route. Um, Alicia may be also doing writing. That's the one thing that we're still focusing trying to figure out is writing. If you qualify for SDI in writing that is still a, a point of, of where we may have to pull kids. We don't want to um, if we can embed that support in the gen ed classroom, we can, um, but we're also talking about maybe doing a co-teach in, in a specific content area to help limit the number of times that they are getting pulled out. 
but it's a huge challenge. And, and to your point, it's, it's, it's kind of the barriers that we as adults continue to create that we're constantly trying to have to battle. And, and for us, that's our, our big piece of it is we, with best intention, and all of a sudden we like, oh, we just created another barrier. Like we need to try and break that down. And so for us, what we've tried to do is keep the language very present, the, the thought process very present so that you can get as many people thinking about how do we problem solve these, these situations um, that may arise like you're experiencing at this point. I think that's a perfect segue. Maybe Jamie, you'd be um, open to sharing a bit about how as the gen ed teacher, you've gotten to know your students' IP goals and how embedding those supports has looked like and how you've developed as an educator just by being a part of that in, you know, embedded instruction and, and what that's been like for you. Yeah, um, like I said earlier, it's kind of been a gradual process with this year being a little bit more intense, given that we've been remote. So we've had to do a lot of more, a lot more intentional planning ahead of time. Um, and so one of the things I we've done is being able to meet with um, like intervention teachers every week to plan for the week ahead of um, our learning. And that's really when we start to look at what are the standards and what are the barriers and being able to have the intervention teachers on our team to help us point out barriers that I might not have recognized as a general education teacher has been super helpful. Um, and then once we do identify those barriers, that's kind of where we start to really look at what is the standard that we really need to look at and how can we give that support to the student in class. Um, and that could be creating materials together. It could be one of us to making one thing and then I'll make another thing. And then, then we're able to deliver instruction there. Um, and another part of it is having some pretty strong collaboration with parents too, which has been a new step um, this year because parents of impacted students, they are sitting right there with their student all day remote because they can't really navigate online learning themselves. So that's where We've had to do weekly meetings with parents just to say like, hey, how's it going? What have you noticed is challenging for your student? And then we plan together to try to address those challenges to try to make it a little bit easier and not so much pressure on parents to be the teacher at home too. Um, so it's been kind of a learning experience for everyone. I feel like I've learned a lot more about how to support students from this and from the collaboration with my teammates within the school and with the parents. I, I think Jamie is undervaluing how much she has co-planned with parents. Um, she has a whole a weekly meeting with, with a parent to talk about what this looks like for full inclusion. Um, this is a student who has Down syndrome, who would historically uh, been placed in a learning center. This student has been in full gen ed since the get-go. Um, all services are pushed in. Um, she literally sits down with the parent, they co-plan, they know exactly what the scope and sequence of the learning looks like. And it's actually made, to ja Jamie's point, a, a pretty tough situation into a really successful situation um, for this little girl. She is thriving um, on core academics, um, whether it's creating access points or using a, um, um, accommodations and supports to help make that that work, it's been it's been awesome, um, and that that has helped kind of lead us to some of the other work that we're doing to to support our other students um, throughout the school year. Absolutely, I would love to revisit um, Cynthia's question. I think Kelly, um, do you feel like you could speak to that a little bit more? We've got kind of what that embedded instruction and that collaboration looks like, and now Kelly could share a little bit more about the what um, power groups look and feel like and sound like in um, a day at Twain. Yeah, so in a typical school year when we're not doing remote or hybrid, <laughs> um, traditionally like our, you know, the kids would sit in class for a whole core um, and then everyone would disperse to a power group. So the whole grade level would then go whether, you know, this group is gonna go to, Miss Wise class, this group is going to go to Miss Hayes class. It's they're all everybody is going. So it it really one of the beautiful things about it is it takes out that stigma that kids were feeling about getting extra help or um, working with a different teacher because everybody is leaving at that point to go 
um, and rotate to a new class. And we we were having students that were being served by other um, interventionalists. So not all kids, SPED kids were going just to a SPED teacher. They may be working with their gen ed teacher or a different gen ed teacher um, at that point in time. And then like Craig was saying, we used data to continuously progress monitor. Um, and as kids were starting to make progress, they may shift up a group. If there was a you know, a topic that was a little more challenging for a kid, they may shift to a different group. Um, so that created that fluidity within our power groups too, so that kids weren't just being stuck in one group, but, you know, with growth, they were moving um, throughout, but every grade level was doing it. So during power group time, every kid just, they kind of knew like it's power group time. We're all rotating. We're all going, grab your stuff. Here we go. And then they'd all come back for the next core lesson. So can I ask, I had a clarifying question then. Thank you so much for um, talking about the power group. So I'm assuming that, for example, I have the master schedule up here and I'm looking at first grade. And let's say, for example, at you know nine o'clock, you have the core lesson. All the students are in their gen ed assigned class, listening to the lesson, and then come 9.30, they're gonna go to their power groups. Are you, are you saying, if I'm understanding this, then if they have, five first grade sections, then you've determined which teacher will be taking certain groups for the whole week, for the whole trimester, like you've already differentiated which teacher is going to take the challenging, whatever, level A, one, two, three, four, however you decide. Um, and then as progress monitoring continues, you're saying it's fluid. Each student will be, you know, one day, oh, you're going to so-and-so's, Miss Osborne's class. Now you're going to go to Miss Martin's class um, throughout the year. Then as a SPED teacher, the only one SPED teacher at the school, how do, are we clustering then some of the students? <laughs> um, how do I provide, I know um, Craig was mentioning SDI can be um, implemented by various members of the staff, which I totally agree. But as one SPED teacher, how would I get my SDI for certain groups? Would I be going to one particular student or classroom in that leveled power group, if that makes sense? So yeah, we, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, so we, um, yes, we have those five classes, like you said, we might intermix other interventionalists as well. And then our SPED teacher also has a power group. Um, and that um, usually um, the teacher or the group that they work with has predominantly special education students based on our data. However, it could include a general education student and it could be that a special education student is actually getting their power group in a general education classroom because that's the level that suits them the most and the data shows that that's what they need. And then the special ed teacher is involved with the progress monitoring, but that other teacher is delivering the SDI during that time. Got it. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how I could spread myself into different sections at one 30 minute block of um, intervention time. Uh, I'm just trying to find the bigger picture. Thank you. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to go down to having that conversation with your, your team or your administration and say, let's look at it a little bit differently on how we can do stuff to, to especially in that situation where you're when you're a standalone because I think that is the the biggest intimidation of how do I serve the number of kids that may need my support and I'm a standalone and I hear that from my colleagues who come back and say well we don't have as many special ed teachers as you do and I'm like well let's look at what your staffing does look like I think we get too much in the route rut of, of doing things the way we've always done it. And what I think what we've learned through this process is we're constantly looking for different and new ways to do things to meet the needs of the kids. And so we often talk about in at 20, is it an adult problem or is it a kid problem? And 99% of our problems are adult problems. Um, and so what we end up doing is, is, okay, let's put the adult problems aside here and try and do what's you know, with the lens for kids. And so what I would say is, you know, do you have support personnel that can help work in those situations that could teach maybe not the most impacted students or, or the highest group that would free up a teacher that could work with, with an impacted group of, or not impacted, but a group that may be lower that needs support in that piece. Um, the other component of it is, is that our time frame, which 
we're looking anywhere between three and six weeks of how these power groups are working in terms of doing the data check. Because we know it takes time for learning to take place and for data to show a significant change. And so it's not one week at a time. We're looking minimum three to six weeks before we do a data drive. And then the, the whole intention though is through that collaborative conversation to be having that because you may have a student that shows significant growth. We fully anticipate, and I think most educators do, uh, you know, we're looking at what's happened in the last year and there's obviously lots of concerns with where kids are academically. And, you know, the first mindset that we're dealing with right now is parents are coming, so we want to retain, we want to retain, we want to retain because we don't think the learning has taken place. And what we're saying is no, no. If there's any data and research out there that has shown one intervention that actually has been proven is retention has proven to be significantly impactful to kids in the future. And what we're actually talking about as a school district is not retaining or, or, or and not doing um, remediation. We're actually talking about kids are adaptable and we need to continue to push them and challenge them. And so one of the things what we're trying to help everybody understand is, is that let's continue to push and keep the rigor in place, even in these power groups with these kids. And so let's think outside the box on how we're gonna be able to do that in order to, to start to see the results. And our kids have stepped up. They step up, they've stepped up every time we continue to challenge them. Even that, even in the remote world, I can say our SPED team has data to show our kids are being successful and they've shown growth. Now, with that said, we've thought outside the box. Um, we've had kids on campus at Mark Twain since the 1st of September. We're one of few schools in the school district that has done that. And, you know, they said, okay, your program kids could be there. Well, we created a way and thought outside the box and brought kids that typically would not have been on campus to do so. I think, I think part of this is taking, having some courage to, to take a leap. And I, and I think the other piece of it is, is making sure that you keep it at the forefront of what you're doing on a daily basis, because there's always gonna be pushback. I will tell you there's gonna be pushback. We have pushback right now as a staff. You know, they're like, oh, it's too hard. We can't do it. No, we're gonna continue to focus on it and so forth. So I just, I would encourage those that are in position of, of leadership to think outside the box and those that are under leadership to push your leadership to think outside the box. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, one more question and it kind of goes with, I don't know if you have the MTSS or the student intervention. I, I think there was something about that team where you are, before you go to eval referrals, um, we have a lot of parents coming with outside evaluations, um, requesting, well, they, you know, the doctor says they need a IEP or a 504 or whatnot. So how, what is that process for you guys? And now that you have the power group, it sounds like you would take those three to six weeks of data and this would be that piece to let parents, even though, yes, we considered your outside evaluation, but this is our, with this, we're gonna give this a shot to try to see where your child is progressing. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yeah, we have a pre-referral or SIT team process um, in the building uh, and, and that involves, we actually, I mean, I know that legally we can't say you have to go to our pre-referral SIT team before you go to guidance team, but we typically um, start there whenever possible. Uh, and we, the first thing we do is look at the data. Have they been power group? What power group have they been in? Do we need to change their power group? Can we add a piece here? or there. Um, and we have our community so aware of power groups now, we have parents asking for them. And, and we've had some difficulty with remote learning and having the school split into two right now in power groups. And we get emails saying, when are power groups starting again? That was you know, important to us. And so parents know that language now, which is really helpful. Um, and then we do have that data when we go to look at, do we need to do a 504 or an IEP? Because we've already been doing all of the interventions and taking the data. We also often, in if, if it's appropriate, we involve the parent in this uh, SIT team process and we'll bring the parent in with the team and we'll have discussions about what we've been trying and what we can try um, a little bit more before we even go to a referral. Um, so we have, we meet once a month, if not more with our SIT team, we actually finally have achieved, uh, we have more intervention team meetings than guidance teams now, which is a source of pride for us. <laughs> 
that's but I was just curious where is where is the max like some parents are like we've been sitting we've been having a lot of intervention meetings mm -hmm. you know we, this is a, we've had two two months have gone by three four months have gone by and we still need to take data we're still so when can we request you know those types of situations wh what would you do um, I think if we if that's true and we're taking that data and we're not showing growth then then that would be the time to do it. I mean, if the data is not showing growth, then absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank I, you. I think it's uh, the process with our power groups and just all the stuff that we've been doing. And I think it's important too for us is each, each in isolation um, would be difficult, but we've tried to align common planning with power groups and having conversations uh, together through our process of learning and getting to this point has actually helped streamline, as Malia said, our, our, our referral process. And actually our referral process has gone down um, because now they're seeing it as a, here's what's happened and here's what they're doing. And when we do get to that point where Malia says we're showing no growth or stagnant growth, we have lots of data at that point to be able to come to that process and make a, a, a honest decision. Obviously, if they come with an outside evaluation, that's something completely different. And we do come as a team together and we go through the process. But as she said, our parents are at the point now where they're actually dialoguing with us and saying, well, maybe they need to be in a different power group, you know, that maybe focuses on this. Or maybe we have some other conversations around what are some accommodations or tools um, that we can use to help that student be successful in that situation. Other questions? This is way easier if you ask questions. <laughs> There's been some good ones. Feel free to also share about your current context and if there's any specific questions or trials that you know, you've been facing, um, stories you'd wanna share, we're happy to hear that out as a team as well. And Naomi, I will add, I just saw the comment that you put there about uh, Kelly in the webinar, or other Kelly. Um, oh, yeah, you probably know her. Um, you, if you said that you come from Lake Washington, Ke uh, Kelly, Kelly Martha, our psychologist, is heavily involved in the SIT team process, which is a little out of the box. Um, the district actually's guidance is that psychologists should not be involved in the pre-referral or SIT team process because then it, they, they feel that it kind of muddies the waters. It's actually, I would say that Kelly would say it's the, her favorite part of the job. And I think she says that in the webinar and she she brings so much to the table um, from a gen ed perspective that um, it's invaluable to have her. Well, and she's able to help provide present conversation and, and say, have you guys thought about this things that we may not have thought about in terms of providing even accommodations or adaptive tools for kids to be successful. So it, it really becomes a, a larger collaborative conversation that I think has been really honest and, and, and helped us even looking at it. Others. Greg, this is Gail. Yeah. Question: um, Do you look do you look at your power group structure as being like an MTSS framework? I mean, do you see it, them? Are they are they coming together that way? Is that what you're how you're organizing it? Or because I, I I'm just kind of curious. I haven't heard that language. I'm just curious how they fit together. I think that because we 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 are kind of at the early part of MTSS in our district um, in terms of what that looked like, we were trying to navigate it ourselves as to to what is the best method to provide supports rather than go from tier one all the way to tier three like in a heartbeat. And I think what we wanted staff to to know in this process, especially with the collaborative conversation, is they are the experts at the grade level, and. And they need to have that dialogue. And if they felt like they were, what we heard before is, well, we're not experts with special education. And I said, okay. I said, but you're experts in core delivery of instruction, whether it's reading, writing, math, or, or whatever it is. I said, you all have valued, uh, valuable information to share with each other. And I said, would it help to bring in some 
bookmarks, being special ed or ELL or safety net to help provide what they do in those smaller group set situations. And people were saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think what we tried to do was use the, the, the team planning as a way to share and dialogue about what is going well in a classroom or what's not going well and what are our fears to empower teachers to make sure they're doing tier one, tier two. And then what we envisioned power groups was more of a tier one plus to tier two plus, right? Like we're, we're providing specific um, focal Because what we also know is we have level four students in the building that we wanted to make sure that we were challenging as well. And so that's why we created that full continuum of support. And, and we've view, viewed a lot of what we've done as a continuum. Um, that's where we started was where could kids focus on a continuum. You could have a student who in third grade is outstanding with multiplication and but maybe struggling with fractions and so maybe their power group would flex with them and so i think that's where we were trying to also empower the teachers on that tier one you are the experts and you're really the experts down to tier two as well in those situations and um along the line and we haven't really talked about it here is this really came about too as part of our equity work and making sure that we were creating um, equitable opportunities for all students. And so we've really tried to pair it through that lens as well as equity is access to. And so um, that was important in terms of the other pieces that we've continued to do in our building. And one of the things we haven't talked about that I think has come out of this is um, the development of what we call our, our special ed help desk. Um, and really that's our partnership with ties and it's our partnership with the University of Washington where teachers bring a pro problem of practice to our staff and we've, we've created opportunities for staff to dialogue back and forth about situations. Our most recent one last week was on grading practices for students who are, you know, Kelly's student who's highly impacted to another student who maybe is less impacted but is, 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 um, maybe not at grade level or accessing the summit of assessments and how do we grade students accurately with that stuff, with, with where they are. And so we're trying to keep the language alive and keep this as a focal point for our staff to keep it in the mindset of what they're doing on a daily basis. So to your, the long answer to that is, yeah, we're seeing it as an MTS as, as in terms of educating and empowering our staff to realize they are the first tier to problem solve. And it's not, sending them to SPED because they're their students. We're trying to get rid of those labels in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Great. Others. I think at this point, it would be wonderful just to um, to kind of branch out here to the big picture and for the team to um, share some of these takeaways they've synthesized for you all, depending on your position and your role in your own inclusion journey. And then we'd love to hear from you what takeaways either on this list or that you might be kind of thinking about as we discussed today that you might be bringing back to your team. Go for it, Milia. <laughs> for us? Oh, you're muted, Naomi. Oops, sorry about that. So feel free to just kind of share some of these ways that our um, guests can sh start this process tomorrow. Got it. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, something that uh, Craig really, I would say mastermind minded, if that's a word um, in this whole experience was uh, taking the power groups um, from an interest-based approach. And uh, we had an interest in starting power groups at Twain and we knew that was gonna be different and it was gonna be hard and it was gonna take work, but we were able to frame uh, that proposal with some key interests that teachers had. Common planning was a big one. Um, and so we were able to come in and say, we want to try this and, you know, in order to get this, this, 
you can do, you know, we can get you the common planning. We can get you, I can't remember what the other things were right now. You might, Craig. Um, and I think that was a really big win because then it was a win for both sides. And then as time has gone on, staff has seen the uh, benefits of power group. And I think we'll want to continue them because of the benefits. But at the beginning, it was a good way to launch into the work. You're muted, Craig, if you're talking. See, you'd think I'd know that by now since we've lived on this computer for so long. I think the other thing people have came back as common interests was they were concerned um, with the number of times kids were being pulled from class. And so how do how do we how do we limit that piece? How do we limit the kids who, you know, are being pulled for multiple content areas of SDI as well as ELL or safety net? And they weren't feeling like they were authentic members of the class or 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 so forth. So a lot of that came from that whole purpose of trying to create an opportunity for kids to be with their community and their community be in their generate classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other takeaways for all of this is, is and, and we've said it in our other webinars and, and I still believe it is it's hard work. It really, what you need to be able to do is develop a system to be able to share and develop ideas and just nothing nothing is out of the possibility um and so you're just kind of throwing things out there um we also know that the journey doesn't stop we we although we've been doing it for a while we know the journey is long way ahead of us and for us our goal is to make this sustainable and and for malia and i that's always been a goal and we create system change in our school district and Gail sat in on meetings with us and Cassie and so is Naomi. I mean, that's a big part for me um, is the, I could leave at the end of the year and I want the staff to continue to do the work that we've been doing um, because we know it's great for kids. It's not good for kids. It's great for kids. And we've learned a lot from our students. Our students are welcoming. They're encouraging and they are, are demonstrating all the things that we adults should be doing with kids who are language learners or reading learners or on SDI. I mean, one of our concerns we've heard from parents, well, you know, if you bring a student in who's highly impacted cognitively, you know, they, they're disrupting the class. And if you listen to one of our webinars, our school counselor had that concern because, she, and she said, she goes, the student was making a lot of noise and I looked at all the rest of the kids and the, the kids in the classroom were actually modeling the behavior that I should have been modeling as an adult. They just kind of said, yep, that's how this individual was and they passed it. And so for us, it's really important to continue to push this forward. And so that it's not, we use the term vapor. It doesn't end just this year, it continues moving forward. To kind of build off of what Craig was saying too, when we first started power groups that first year, my grade level started, they just dove, we dove in, we did math and reading in the same week. And I like, I truly thought I was losing my mind for those first couple of weeks, just trying to like plan for every chunk of time. But once we got used to it, it was the kids' favorite time of day. It became my favorite time of day. It was a smaller group, so we can kind of have some more intentional fun. And then throughout the year, we could really, as teachers, see the growth in all kinds of students by getting that kind of smaller intentional instruction. And with that growth too, it seems like it's brought a lot of curiosity among staff members too, where we're asking questions like, well, what is UDL and how do we do that? And we're curious about more inflexible instruction and we want to, we want answers to those questions, which is kind of how that inclusion helped us came about too, where people are super excited to ask the questions, get the answers, and then kind of figure out how to change instruction so that it does work for all students. I think one of the things for me as well is being a teacher um, who teaches predominantly self-contained historically um, and working with students with moderate to severe disabilities, what does inclusion look like for my group of students and how can we create um you know those integrated opportunities and um we've had some kiddos who have spent you know k to 
third grade in a separate classroom and then they you know started to build friendships in their gen ed classroom and got to have play dates for the first time in their life and creating um social opportunities for them and having um you know seeing kids in the hallway just get excited to see my students and see teachers get excited to see our students um, and just really kind of looking at making sure that there's meaningful opportunities for every kid in our school um, regardless of placement regardless of classroom and what does that look like and how can we build up peer support in the classroom um, and just different opportunities has been a journey for me to look at, you know, what are those moments throughout the day that we can create inclusive opportunities in and, and what does that look like for each individual student in my classroom and how can our whole school kind of get on board with it. And like Craig and Leah have said, our school is has turned into just such a welcoming, positive community where every kid is just recognized and has a connection and that was a huge thing was how can we make sure every kid in this building has a connection um and it's it's been really cool to see what a beautiful note to kind of lead us to wrapping up kelly thank you for that i can't wait to get there in person personally <laughs> um to feel that energy that's really awesome any takeaways from our people visiting today that you want to share in terms of what you'll want to bring back to your teams or what you feel like your next steps might be, feel free to unmute or share in the chat or ask any lingering questions. No pressure, of course. Keep it coming in the chat if something um, arises in your mind. Um, but I'm going to kind of shift gears here. First of all, just a huge thank you and a huge celebration um, to our Twain team for being leaders in, um, you know, sharing their journey with us repeatedly and over and over and being vulnerable and open to, you know, sharing their practice. I am so appreciative for my own learning to get to engage with you all and appreciative that you're sharing that outward to others as well. Um, so um, with that, um, we would just love to get feedback on our session today. Um, this will give us information um, we can use to effectively share demo sites inclusionary practices in the future. Um, so I'm going to put a link in the chat. And this link um, will lead you to a brief survey through Google Forms. It's anonymous and Molly um, from our team will send clock hour forms to those who are in attendance today. Um, oops, and then get my slides here. Great. And so a bit more information to follow up if you want to see Twain's webinars, their artifacts, as well as other information about the project and our other teams that we work with, feel free to visit our demo site, ippdemosites.org um, website. Um, you can also reach us through email at uwdemosites at uw.edu. Um, and let's see, Cassie, am I missing anything in terms of Oh, you can also find out more information in terms of um, other open house opportunities and virtual visits that we have um, coming up. Yeah, I was going to say they're on the events page on our website and a follow up email will be sent that will include some of the artifacts um, that we uh, plugged into the chat along with um, um, along with uh, uh, clock hour forms uh, to fill out and return. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, thanks to all our partners and to our ties partners who are here today. And of course, most importantly, to our Twain team for your commitment to this work and sharing everything that you shared with us. Let's stop our sharing. Wonderful job, Twain team. Thank you. I, I would also just say if anybody has specific questions, they can always reach out to us directly. Yes, great point. Thanks for sharing that. Craig, Malia, would you mind, or anyone who's open to that, sticking your email in the chat? Yeah.
Thanks, Malia. Thank you, Craig. Bye, guys. See you later. See you, Gail. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Gail. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Congratulations. You guys were wonderful. That was really good, you guys. That was super. Oh, let me stop recording. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs>